data and measurements. Now, in science, it's the scientist's job to kind of describe the world around them. And so, we, as scientists, we use data and measurements in order to describe the world around us. They're kind of the tools of the trade of a scientist. The essence of science is to make observations about the natural world around you. And the scientist designs experiments in order to explore some very specific phenomena. One way in which they design these experiments is with a control, which is an aspect of the experiment that remains the same throughout the experiment. They do not allow it to be changed. A variable, on the other hand, is an aspect of the experiment that can be changed by the scientist. It's a characteristic that we are interested in seeing if it has an effect on the real world, or on the natural world. Once we run an experiment, it's important that we make observations. This is the information that is gathered during the course of an experiment. We can categorize it into two types. And I've made the first part of these words in blue because I hope that you can see a word stuck in there. Qualitative is an observation that deals with qualities. For example, characteristics like colors and shapes or textures. Quantitative has the word quantity in it. And that's an observation that deals with quantities or numbers. An example might be 10 apples, or 34.82 centimeters, it's something you can count. It is critical when you make quantitative measurements that you tell every other scientist in the world what kind of units you are using so that they can apply the same units as you do. It is very common that scientists repeat their experiments to see if they make the same observations over and over and over again. The repetition of the experiment is known as a trial. Usually, three trials is enough to ensure that you can see the same thing over and over again or your observation is reproducible. In order to make quantitative measurements, it's very common that we use measuring tools to make quantitative measurements. These tools come in two forms. One is a digital, digital. These are measurements in which numbers are displayed for you. For example, this is the iPhone timer. And you see a 2, an 8, a decimal, and a 3. And it's pretty simple. simple. All the scientist needs to do is record every single number that shows up on the screen. Now you're going to need to include a unit, 28.3 seconds. The second kind of tool is an analog tool. And that uses increments, which is a fancy way, uh, name for uh, something that's divided up into the same size. But these increments are used to represent a measurement. Now, this kind of tool requires the scientist to interpret the measurement and is difficult for, your, uh, for physics students to take. So let's go through this together. Now I have two analog measuring devices here. They do the same thing, but one measures in centimeters and millimeters. This is called the metric. Metric way of measuring distances. But then again, I have a second one that does the same thing, and this is imperial. Now the one on top measures in centimeters and millimeters. The one on bottom measures in inches. And here we go, eighth of an inch from there to there is one eighth of an inch. Unfortunately, I don't really like uh, fractions. So I would choose to use a metric system given the choice. Now the metric system is really cool. Basically, the imp Increments are what are tell you what place the number is going to show up in your measurement. For example, the length of the meter stick 
represents whole meters, and so you get these numbers in front of the decimal. For example, one. For example, one point meter, or sixteen meters. Whole meters are represented by the length of a meter stick. But then these increments that are actually tick marks that show up on the meter stick divided into equal parts. And each one of those parts has a special position in the measurement. So for example, if we have 10 equal parts, we call that the decimeter. And that belongs in the tenths, tenths place. Right there. So for example, 0.3 meters. 1.6 meters, 124 whole meters, but then in addition a 0.9 or a tenth of a meter. If we move on and have 100 equal parts, also known as centimeters, then we get to add one more digit of information and our, and our measurement becomes more precise. And so the hundredths place follows the tenths. And so we get 30.35 meters, or 1.60 meters, or 124.91 meters. And then finally, if we round out the set, if we have 1,000 equal parts, also known as millimeters, that represents 1,000th of a meter. And so we get to add another decimal. And that's in the thousand, uh, tens, hundreds, thousandths place. So, for example, 0 0.352 meters, or 1.608 meters, or 124.913 meters. So, what's this look like? So, basically, if we start looking at the meter stick and uh, using this metric system, we can step by step develop a very precise measurement. So if we look at the meter stick with it and ignore the tick marks, so far my red bar here, my red sample, has not uh, does not encompass one whole meter yet. So I can use the zero to represent that it's not even one meter yet, zero point meters. But now, if I divide the meter stick up into 10 equal parts, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 equal parts, I can add a digit to my measurement. Now it's not only 0, but now it's 0 point, not 1, 0 0.2, because my measurement occurs somewhere between here. 0 0.2 meters. All right. Now, in order to clarify, I have blown up this segment. Nope, I haven't. In order to clarify, I'm going to take a look at this segment, and I'm going to blow it up here so we can see it even better. All right. And here, now the meter stick, we're paying attention to the centimeter tick marks. Now we've already established the zero, because it's not multiple meters, point two in the uh, example above, and now I've divided between point two and point three up into ten equal boxes again. This is the beauty of the metric system. Once you've figured it out for one increment, you can just simply do the same activity again. And so it's not one point, I'm sorry, point Two one or 0 0.22, it's 0 0.26 because it occurs between these two numbers. Well, what happens if I uh, if I look even closer and look at the next decimal? Now we're looking at a meter stick with millimeter marks and. I've established that the first number in my measurement is a zero. If 
followed by a 2, followed by a 6, and now I've divided it up into 10 more. And so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I believe, is this number going to be 0 0.261 here? No. 0 0.262 or 3 or 4? No, it occurs right here. So I'm going to put a 5 in that final place. Now, I've run out of tick marks. Meter sticks don't include mark tick marks closer than millimeters. And I think you can see why. Do you see how crammed up these numbers are? But the scientist gets one last shot to make it more accurate. They estimate how close the object is to one tick mark or the other. And so here's a couple rules of thumb. If the object is exactly, exactly on the tick mark that you reported last, I would put a zero in this last spot right here. If it's really close to that tick mark, maybe a one or a two or a three. If it's exactly halfway between one and the next, you might put a five in this spot here. And if it's really close to the further tick mark, maybe you'd put a seven or an eight, or maybe even a nine. And so, if we take a look, the zero, the two, the six, and the five, these are all tick marks on device, right? But I, as the scientist, get to make that last measurement. And I see that my measurement is not a little bit further away from the five, closer to the six. So I'm going to estimate that last digit to be a six. And then most important, I'm going to include a unit. Now this allows you to create an, an incredibly precise distance measurement simply by using a meter stick.